All right, so um, 30,000 subscribers almost on YouTube. Um, one of my friends or family members said, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so basically saying, if you don't keep making videos, you're not taking advantage of having 30,000 subscribers. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, okay, well, maybe I should make some more videos, but the videos that I was making that were getting all the views, the ones with the animation and stuff, those take a lot of time for me to do, and I'm working, and so it's hard for me to find time to put together the animation. But one friend was like, hey, just, you know, just make videos of you talking. You know, you don't need to put, you know, all the animation in. So I apologize that there's not going to be as many new videos for the animation, but, um, but I will talk about stuff related to psychology and stuff that I hadn't talked about before. So hopefully you'll find it interesting. So the next few videos that, that I'm going to talk about really is mostly abnormal psychology. So we're going to go through diagnoses, different diagnoses, mental health diagnoses that people can get um, assigned with throughout their life. And um, basically, if you look at this book, it's called The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And so um, the American Psychiatric Association makes this book, and they come out with a new version every so often. Um, and the book essentially lists out all the symptoms that you have to have to fall into a, a certain diagnosis. And so, um, and they list out the different criteria. And so, um, if you meet, if you go through all the criteria um, and you get a psychological evaluation or um, the psychological evaluation, they say, you know, so and so meets DSM 5 criteria for major depressive disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or, you know, oppositional defiant disorder or, you know, there's a lot of different ones. But um, but that just means that they're looking in this book. They say that you have all the symptoms that you need to be to, to, to get diagnosed with this particular condition. Um, and, you know, I've done psychological evaluations, so I can kind of give you some insight on you know, kind of what we're thinking about when we look at different diagnoses, and hopefully maybe you'll find that interesting um, and hopefully enlightening about about um, certain things. So anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, the first condition that we're going to talk about, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And um, a lot of people think, you know, they say, well, I don't have ADHD, I have ADD, and meaning attention deficit disorder. Um, so they, the DSM-5 basically said there's no ADD, it's all ADHD. So everything now is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So there's, there's three types of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There's the hyperactive impulsive type which means that they don't really have trouble paying attention, but they're just really hyperactive and impulsive. Um, then you have the type, the antenna type, and that's where they're not really hyperactive, they're not really impulsive, but they have trouble paying attention. And so that's what we would think of as ADD. It's, it's now called ADHD, inattentive type. Um, and then there's the ADHD combined type, which means they have both the inattention and the hyperactive impulsive. So they have all of the symptoms. So um, ADHD is a developmental, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that you're born with ADHD. It's not something that you acquire throughout your life. So somebody is, you know, there's people that have said, well, you know, I didn't have problems paying attention when I was a kid. But as an adult, I think I got ADHD when I was an adult. Well, that's not really how it works. You, you, when you have ADHD, you have it from, you know, pretty much when you're born. And so um, the DSM criteria says, DSM-5 criteria says that the symptoms have to be present before age 12. So you have, you have to see the ADHD symptoms before age 12 um, to meet criteria for the diagnosis. The, the problem with that. Uh, for us as psychologists with evaluators is that a lot of times kids and adults or adults will come in to get evaluated and there's not really a lot of stuff we have to go on to be able to diagnose them because the criteria all applies to kids, you know, because that's, you know, because like I said, it's, it's all, you have to see this stuff at age 12 or younger. 
So let's talk about what the criteria looks like. So um, these are inattentive senses. And so if you have six out of nine of these, this means that you meet criteria, you meet the inattentive criteria for ADHD. Um, and, and remember, we're talking about a 12-year-old or younger. So I'm going to go through them. So the first one is often fails to give close attention to details or make a careless mistake at schoolwork. Often has difficulty sustaining attention in tasks or play activities. Often does not seem listen to listen when spoken to directly. Often does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish schoolwork, chores, or duties in the workplace. Often has difficulty organizing tasks and activities. Often avoids dislikes or reluctant or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort. Often loses things necessary for tasks or activities. Is often easily distracted by by extraneous stimuli, um, so very distractible, and is often forgetful in daily activities. So typically, what we do is we we give this to the parents, and if the parents say six out of nine of those things are occurring often or very often, then we usually say, okay, this child may meet criteria for ADHD if the child's younger than 12. Now, a kicker is that according to the DSM, the symptoms have to be present in two or more settings. So if mom comes in and we, we, we do a survey with mom and we get all these symptoms, and mom says, okay, he's got six out of the nine of the inattentive symptoms of ADHD. And then we give like, the same questionnaire to the teacher and the teacher says, I'm not seeing it. I don't, I don't see any of the symptoms. Then we can't diagnose him with ADHD because, you know, he's only showing symptoms at home. He's not showing symptoms at school. And, and the reason for that is it may not be something wrong with the kid. It may be the environment that they're in. Maybe at home they're more hyperactive, and so that's why uh, it's not that the kid has ADHD or there's something wrong with their brain. It's just at home, it's more, you know, they may have a chaotic environment, and they may act more hyperactive, or the opposite, maybe they have a chaotic environment at home, and then when they go to school, they're hyperactive. The mom at home is saying, well, he's fine at home. There's no problems with him at home. So um, so that's one of the reasons why we typically will will ask teachers and parents about ADHD symptoms when we look to make a diagnosis. Now, I just went through the inattentive symptoms of ADHD. Now, there's also hyperactive impulsive symptoms, and I'm going to read those to you. And remember, we're talking about boys and girls ages 12 or younger. So um, here, here we go. So here's the non-symptom, um, and this is hyperactive impulsivity. Often fidgets with or taps hands or feet or squirms in seats. Seat, often leaves seat when, in situations when remaining seated is expected. Often runs or climbs in situations when it's inappropriate. Often is unable to play or engage in leisure activities quietly. Is often on the go or acting as if driven by a motor. Often talks excessively. Often blurts out an answer before questions have been completed. Often has difficulty waiting his or her turn. Often interrupts and intrudes in on others' conversations. So, um, so that's the inattentive hyperactivity. So if a kid has six out of nine of those, and then the six out of nine of the inattentive, then they have the combined type. Okay, if they only have six out of nine of the inattentive, and they don't, and they don't have six out of nine of the hyperactive impulsive, then they have the inattentive type. And if they have six out of nine of the inattentive, or the hyperactive impulsive, but not the inattentive, then they have the hyperactive impulsive type. And if they have six out of nine of both, then they have the com what's called the combined type. Combined type is the most common type. Um, and, you know, uh, from me evaluating kids with ADHD, it, you know, when you get a kid that's young enough, you can tell that they have ADHD, especially if they're hyperactive and impulsive. They'll be moving around, climbing up on the desk. They'll be talking. You'll have to kind of, you know, get them. It's very difficult to get them to focus on what, what you're trying to do. So um, so you can, you can, you can tell um, when you have a kid with ADHD. So... Um, so, yeah, and, and like I was mentioning, one of the biggest problems is that, you know, um, the, this is the criteria, right? So, um, when you have an adult, you kind of have to go, okay, well, did you have these problems when you were 12 or younger? And sometimes when you have an adult that's in their 30s or 40s, they may not remember, you know, and sometimes you have to get their parents, maybe ask their parents those questions. Um, but a lot of times you can't act, access their parents, and so we don't really have a good way to diagnose ADHD in adults. Um, you know, we, we, we can do 
do it, but it's it's definitely there's no guidelines really for it, which I think is a problem with the field. But um, but yeah, and, and a lot of times you know um, parents you know will will take their kids to get evaluated, and then they'll realize oh you know you know I, some of the things that my kid was struggling with I struggled with too, and then they're going to get evaluated. And ADHD does have a genetic component to it, so. A lot of times when you have a kid with ADHD, you know, one of the parents probably has it. You know, he got it from, you know, one of, one of the other parents. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really, you know, um, that, that's important when diagnosing ADHD is, you know, the kid can have all those symptoms, um, but if they um, are not having any problems in school or making friends or with their self-esteem or anything like that, um, then it, they can't be diagnosed because they have to have some kind of problems in school with self-esteem. Or, but if you think about it, like like listen to these things, like fails to give attention to detail, um, has difficulty um, paying attention to class, has difficulty, it dislikes things that require ongoing mental, mental effort, loses things, um, blurts out answers before questions are completed, talks obsessively. What kind of reaction do you all think is, that's going to get from people. It's going to get negative reactions. People are going to, parents, teachers, peers, they're not going to like that kind of stuff. They're going to find it annoying. So it is going to get negative reactions from peers. It's also going to prevent them from doing well in school a lot of the time. So most of the time that box gets checked if they meet the, the list of criteria for ADHD. Um, so, you know, um, like I said, typically we'll give questionnaires at home and at school so we can see it in two settings. Um, one of the good things about ADHD is um, psychostimulant medication um, treatment. And, and um, psychostimulant medication treatment is, I, I, I'm not saying this because I'm not a psychiatrist, but I've heard psychiatrists say that it's the most effective treatment that we have in psychiatry. So, you know, a lot of the time stimulants will be effective for treating kids with ADHD. And a lot of parents will say, well, you know, my kid's hyperactive. Like, you know, why would I give my child a stimulant to help him with his hyperactivity? And um, my response to that is, well, you know, there's actually a part of the brain that says, no, don't do that. Like, that's not a good idea. Like, don't throw that chair across the room. You know, don't punch the wall. You know, don't hit, hit your classmate. You know, don't do that. That's not a good idea. There's a part of the brain that lights up when we decide not to do those things. And so um, what happens is when, when kids take the stimulants, uh, the, you know, kids with ADHD, those parts, that parts of the brain, they don't light up. And so they, that's why they have these hyperactive impulsive behaviors. But when they take the stimulants, it actually lights up and activates this part of the brain so they can better control themselves in school. Um, and so a lot of parents really worry about, you know, putting their kids on a stimulant but, you know, one of the things that I always tell them is, you know, um, it's associated with better outcomes. You know, they're able to do their best in all areas of their life because they're able to control themselves. They're able to do better in school. They do better in relationships. They do better in all areas of their life. And so with their self-esteem, they want to feel good about themselves. And especially when they're really young, you're starting to compare yourself to other kids and, like, you know, learning what you're good at and what you're not good at. And, you know, if you're, you know, getting all this negative feedback from people all the time, they're telling you you're, you know, you start to feel bad about yourself. So, um, so taking the medicine can kind of help them be able to do their best. And, you know, it's not a smart pill. I mean, a lot of people think it's a smart pill. It can help you pay attention better, you know, even if you don't have ADHD. But um, it's not a smart pill, you know. Um, it can, it just, it corrects some of the problems that we see with ADHD. So, um, so, and, and the research that we see shows that, that even as adults um, who take this psychostimulant medication, they do better, they live longer lives. Um, so I always try to tell parents there's nothing wrong with putting your kid on a stimulant if they have ADHD. And, and honestly, I recommend it. Um, and most uh, family doctors and psychiatrists recommend it as well. Um, and, and that's a lot of the fight for us is trying to convince parents that it's a good idea to put their children on stimulus if they have ADHD. Um, and, I, and I know it does sound counterintuitive, like my child's hyperactive, why am I putting them on medication? 
So um, there are side effects of the medication. You know, they can suppress appetite, um, and they're also really, um, you know, can help can make you stay awake. You know, like like most stimulants, um, and they can also stimulate your bowels and you know make you have to go to the bathroom, but. Um, but for the most part, um, the trade-offs are, are, are usually good for, for a child with ADHD. So this is ADHD. Um, that's, you know, I'd love to hear y'all's comments in the comment section about ADHD or if you have any questions or any other videos that you think I should make on ADHD, I'd be happy to do that. I'm going to talk about oppositional defiant disorder tomorrow, and that is kind of um, a, a condition that's diagnosed frequently with with ADHD. So, um, so thanks so much for watching the video and, and uh, hope, hopefully you'll tune into the next one.